Hey, can we welcome our Greece campus that's with us right now? Hey, Greece campus, it's so good to see you. So glad that you're there. So excited that, here we go. So good to see you guys. Listen, I want to just let you know, the Fala La event that we have out there is a free event. The only reason why there are tickets, free tickets, is so that when you have a ticket, you know you got a seat. Otherwise, you bring family and friends, and if you don't have a ticket, you arrive, and there's no place, and then it's just no fun, and it just takes the wind out of the sail. The second thing I want to let you know, how many uh, men in this place uh, just um, love, love that we get to uh, host family for Christmas and Thanksgiving. We just don't like the to-do list that precedes Thanksgiving. Come on, how, how many men knows what I'm talking about? I said to my wife, nobody is that important. It just isn't. Man, the to-do list. My wife's having me work like crazy for Thanksgiving already. And you know what she said to me? She says, the way we prepare and host communicates the value of the people who are coming. Uh, you, you may want to just write that down. So if we just slap it together, we are saying you slap, slapping together kind of people. But when we host right, um, it communicates that we value you in the same way. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to host our community. Last year, over 8,000 people came to experience the story of Christmas. And they came to experience this family. That's why Pastor Chris was saying, we need as many of you that says, yes, I can serve for one of the eight of, of the nine gatherings. Because it takes 150 people per gathering to host the way that it communicates value to people. And if you don't sign up and you can to serve, what happens is we've got 150 people that's got to serve nine times. And then... After the ninth time, they leave church. And I've got to go hunt them down and go like, I promise we'll never do this again with you. We'll find another 150 to do this with. But when we all surf together, when we all host together, the most beautiful thing is there are people sitting here among us that I greeted that Jesus has changed their lives and they came as a guest of someone to follow our last year and they discovered the love of Jesus that transforms hearts. So I want to encourage you, Greece campus, uh, Child Light campus, online sign up. It's going to be spectacular. Are you guys ready this morning? Now you're going to need this card, this uh, Thanksgiving card um, because we're going to have some reflection time at the end. And lighting guys, if you can move this light over for me just a tad. I step out of it every now and then. And it's um, going to be interesting to navigate um, stepping into it all the time. Okay, here we go. I, I want to share a message with you that I really believe is um, going to uh, thicken and um, put another layer of grace over our Thanksgiving season. I shared some of this message with our call this past Wednesday, and I shared it at the speed of light, and after that they said, I think you should preach this again this weekend, but slow down. Say everything that needs to be said. So for those who gathered at call, you're going to hear some of what you've already heard, but trust me, the Spirit of God has a way to articulate what you didn't hear at call. You know, the world that we are living in is a tremoring right now. It's shaking. It's vacillating. Um, there is not a single news channel that you do not switch on that doesn't create some tremors in your heart. Uh, people don't want to travel. You, you don't know where to go. The, the word ISIS has become a tremor, a word that we don't understand. Where is this going to stop? B but Scripture talks about these things as birth pains. Before the coming of Christ, he says, when you see these things, you know that something else is coming. When you see the leaves fall from the tree, you know winter is coming. When, when you see the tremors of the broken world, you know that it's coming. And then in 1 Corinthians 13, which is this love chapter, he comes to verse 13, and this is the easiest. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. Yes, it says these 
things. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, I'm going to ask all the campuses to read it out loud and turn to your neighbor and say, I'm just reading it for you because I know it off by heart. I just, I'm just going to hook you up with this. Here we go, everybody. It goes like this. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Come on, let's do it one more time. Three things will last forever, faith, hope and and the greatest of these is love you know what it's saying he says at the end of the day when you shake this down and you take all the layers out the three most important things that will remain is faith hope and love now stop right there i want to use these three things to frame what i believe we can build our lives on because we know it is very smart to build your life on the three things that will remain. Everything else is not worth building your life on because these three things, after all is said and done, will hold it all together. Come on, everybody, let's shout faith. faith. Come on, I want to feel you shout faith. faith. Now, faith describes, I believe, the way we are called to walk. Faith describes the way we are called to walk. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and we read about the heroes of faith. Now, I've shared this before. As, as you can go to the uh, baseball hall of fame, when you walk through this place and you look at pictures and photographs, and, and you go, and I'm sure there's statues. I've never been to those ones. Like, right? Real people things? Yes? No? Whatever. Um, you, you go like, why is this person in here? Why is Babe Ruth's picture in here? You don't go like, he was a great a person who just liked the game. You're like, no, 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 no. You see, he played the game like no one played. He, he is not there because he liked it. He's here because he was legendary for it. So when we read about people, and he says in Hebrews 11 to men of God in days of old were made famous for their faith, then he uses names like Moses and Jacob and um, Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Gideon. You, you wonder what people see in these people that they would go like, wow, you are legendary for faith. Now, that's not a hard question because, you see, I can test it right now. Come on, work with me now, everybody. Can you tell me what Noah was famous for? People, you've seen the movie. It's not hard. Come on, what was Noah famous for? He pulled an ark. What was Moses famous for? He led people out of Egypt into the desert to a land of promise that he has never seen. Abraham took his son, his only son, the son of promise, and he was ready to sacrifice him because he believed if he had to sacrifice his son, God would raise his son from the dead. Hey, Gideon, he saw his army being diminished to 300 men, yet he persisted because he believed that God is the God of the battle, and he stormed a whole country's army with 300 men and God brought them victory. The Bible says through faith, Israel went through the Red Sea. Hey, when they came to the city called Jericho, the walls were impenetrable. They were so high, so wide. But the Bible says they didn't walk away. They walked around because they believed that their God was able to make a molehill of a mountain. Through faith, they kept persisting. What did David do? He didn't back away from Goliath. He was not famous for faith songs in the desert. No, his faith songs in the desert turned into courageous heart in the battle. And he looked the giant in the eyes. You see what I've come to discover? Faith is a catalyst to courage and courage is a catalyst to bravery. And people who walk by faith walk courageously with large amounts of bravery. Ladies and gentlemen, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33 and 34. Come on, all the campuses, let's read this together. He says, these people, come on, all trusted God. Come on, and as a, come on, shout as a result. As a result of their faith. Let me ask you a question. Can you point into your life to things that as 
is as a result of your faith. The way you love people as a result of your faith. The way you engage the world as a result of your faith. The way you serve as a result of your faith. Because the Bible says as a result, here we go. They won battles, overthrew kingdoms, ruled their people well, received what God has promised them. They were kept from harm in a den of lions, in a fiery furnace. Some through their faith escaped death by sword. Some were made strong again and they had been weak or sick. Come on. Others were given great power and battle. Come on, everybody. They made whole armies turn and run away. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of life that we are called to live. God has no desire to help us live diminished lives that are invisible. Do you understand that within the framework of your life lies greatness? Faith is a catalyst to courage. Great faith is a catalyst to Great courage. And I know some of you may be saying, man, I wish I had some of that. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 reads like this. I'm going to encourage you to read it out loud. It says, as God has dealt to, to who? If you're at each one and all of our campuses, can you shout yes? yes. You're at each one. What did he give you? A measure of faith. And what did we just say? What is faith a catalyst of bravery and courage so as you were sitting in front of me there is bravery and courage that is inside of you right now and all I can tell you is is that bravery and courage is not an absence of fear but bravery and courage penetrates fear Walks into fear. Why? Because I know who is for me. I know who is on my side. I know that God has already gone before me. I know that the mighty one is a battle. You know what David said to Goliath. He says, you come to me with, with swords and spears. I come to you in the name of the Lord. I believe that David was very aware that God was not in heaven, that God was with him in the battle. That not only are you fighting me, you're fighting us right now. Because the mighty one of Israel is very present in this battle. Therefore, I want to say to all of us in this place, I believe since we have received a measure of faith and a measure of courage, the way for faith to become enlarged and courage to become more, we have got to exercise our faith. Come on, shout exercise. Come on, everybody, shout exercise. If we do not exercise our faith, our faith will become diminished. Dennis, can you come help me? That's going to really, really help me preach this last message. So, so I can tell you this is so awesome. Uh, I began to realize, well, not began, I don't know, this is a fact, it's just doing it. Um, you cannot reach further and become more unless you become stronger as a person. God will never put more on you if you do not become more in carrying more things. So some of you go like, God, I want you to do great things through my life. I grow into greatness and greatness will follow you. So, so first step for us is we've got to further our education. So eight of us are furthering our education. And I've got a paper due next Tuesday. Pro please pray for me. It's like, really? A paper? So all of you writing papers, we understand. And then another thing is the Lord spoke to me. He says, you will only live as long as you take care of your body. Right? So we got a personal trainer for all of our executive staff. <laughs> so funny. I've never seen grown men act like babies. They do two push-ups. I said to Pastor Robbie, is that your metro face? Because right now you're not going to get a wife if you look like that. <laughs> because you don't realize when you don't exercise, you become weaker. And I want to say this to you. If you do not act on your faith, your faith becomes diminished. That's why I believe with all of my heart, we've got to take our loving and add faith to it so it becomes courageous loving. You see, if we don't love with faith love, it will never be courageous love. You say, Pierre, what does it mean faith love? I'm going to tell you how we love people. We love people on condition that they play this right. Liking and loving kind of gets all mixed up. But you know what faith love is? 
when it says right now, in my own capacity, it's hard to love you, but I do not live from my own capacity. I'm a brand new crea creation in Christ. The love of God has been poured out in my heart. Therefore, in me is the capacity to faith love you. That means even if you hate me, I can push through the coldness and embrace you with courage and love you. No matter what you say, I will not let that push me away. I will swim through that and get to your heart. No matter how callous you are, I will love you and forgive you even if you are unfaithful the love of God will remain faithful even if you are unfair the love of God will remain fair and when I fix my eyes on putting faith in my love I can love courageously and so can you even the people that's an irritation and sent out of hell we can love them because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts not only do we serve, but we put faith in our serving so we can serve courageously. You say, how do you put faith in your serving? I shared this that I, I met somebody that said to me, um, I said, hey, do you serve? He says, you can't afford my time for me to serve. I go like, oh. So you think what you earn for a living should be compensated when you serve the things of God and the breath in your lungs is borrowed. Now, if I'm God, thank God I'm not, I would squeak you like a rubber ducky right now until you quack with joy and you go like anything God anything because you see in this moment when when we don't put faith in our serving we think through the lens of inconvenience and what must i do why must i do this but you see when we put faith in our serving we realize if you want to be great in god's kingdom you've got to be a servant and a servant is not a posture of the heart a servant is an act of doing and an act of being that's why for some of you this is your most important card of the day because you see you are refreshed to commit your life to do something because you were like I don't know what's gonna happen and I'm here to tell you you put faith in it because the Bible says whatever you do in word or in deed do it as unto the Lord and he is the rewarder for those who faithfully serve his house faithfully serve the purposes of the kingdom Jesus says in Revelation listen I'm coming with a payroll under my arms and when I come I will reward everyone for what they have done seen and unseen in the kingdom of God do you realize that's why volunteers shows up year after year after year after year when you do not see not because they look for your applause they have put faith in their service which brings courage and endurance and in that way I am here they are here our technical teams are here because we are serving the one who has rescued our hearts and has given his life to us and that's why we can can serve and you can serve courageously we take our giving and unless we put faith in our giving we will never give courageously hey do you give courageously because you see giving is a strange thing in our world the name of the game is gaining not giving the one who's got the most is the one who wins but you see, when I put faith to my giving, I realize I can never lose when I give courageously. Because God has got an interesting way He works. He says, if you want to be great, go down. Be a servant. If you want, give. If you want love, give your love away. Because He says, give and it shall be given. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together. You see, when I put faith in my giving, I realize that the source that has brought me to this moment is the source that will be with me all the way home. That the source who is blessing my life will never dry up. It is not the Father's house who is my paycheck. It is God Almighty who is my source of every good thing. And it is your source of every good thing. And in that moment, I understand that God blesses my life and He blesses this is your life. So part of that, we can have that be a courageous blessing to other people. That's why Scripture says um, that God has ordered our lives to be generous so that out of our generosity, others can be blessed. So the question is, 
Are you loving courageously? Are you living courageously? Are you serving courageously? Are you giving courageously? Or are you living a careful life with diminished outcomes in your faith? Come on, shout hope for me. Oh, I want to hear you shout hope. I believe as faith describes how we are called to walk with bravery and courage, I believe hope describes where we are anchored. Oh, there is no better time for us to be firmly assured where we are anchored right now. I love the scripture in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. And come on now, this, I think this is the last one. Is it? Is it? No, two more, two more. Last one. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're doing very well this morning. You smell delightful on, on top of that. So this is great. Romans 15, 13. Come on, Greece campus, everybody. Let's read this out loud. No, may the God of hope fill you with, come on, shout it out, joy and peace as you believe in him so that you may, so that you may abound. You know what a bound is? Plentiful, overfull, and brimming with hope by the power of His Spirit. We serve a God of hope. And all around us right now, people are asking our opinion of what's happening. You know what the sad thing is that so many of us, have, we have become good at measuring what is, but hope never measures what is. Hope is declaring what can be. And you see, um, uh, it doesn't take someone with faith to tell you that the world is a mess, but it takes someone who is filled with hope to say better things is yet to come. And I believe with all of my heart that you and I in this time should be hope carriers. You know why? Because we are deeply anchored in hope. I believe the temperature of our lives should be filled with joy and peace because the God of hope has filled us with an abundance of hope. Now the writer of the book of Hebrews, interesting enough, some says Paul wrote it and some scholars says, we are uncertain who wrote the book of Hebrews, yet we are very clear that he wrote it to a people that was struggling, being persecuted for their faith. If I say persecuted, I don't mean they don't like you. They whip you, they kill you. They stone you to death. Your family cast you out. And we understand many of the believers in the book of Hebrews was about to give up on their faith in Jesus because of this. And this writer uses an anchor as a metaphor. Is that the right way to say it? I get stuck every time. Is that right, Dennis? Meta metaphor? Whatever. It's French. A metaphor. We say metaphor. Metaphor stuck right there never happened keep going a metaphor he says an anchor is very needed when there is a storm because you see what the currents and the wind does it, it takes the boat and the destruction is not in the storm it's in what the storm takes the boat into and slam it against but when you are anchored, no storm can move the boat. You've just got to wear the storm out because you will not be destroyed when you are anchored. Here is the only problem. An anchor is only half a hope. Only when an anchor is anchored in something immovable do you sit with hope. And I believe too many people sit with half hope. They are dragging their anchors through the seabed of life. They go like, oh, I think I'm anchored. But they're dragging and they feel tossed and destroyed. Destroyed. Watch what he is saying in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, 18. This is the last scripture. Everybody, Greece campus, let's read it together. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have, oh, come on, shout it out, great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. I love this. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our soul. Watch. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Now, I know for many of you, you go like, what does it mean, the curtain in the inner sanctuary? I'm going to hook you up. Whenever we hear about the curtain in the inner sanctuary, it describes where the resting place, the, the seating of God, the power of God, the throne of God resides. The writer says, listen, 
we can take refuge in this hope because our, our lives are anchored not to the seabed, not to a rock, but into heaven beyond the streets of gold, beyond the valley that is beautiful, beyond the veil into the presence of God. It's connected to His throne. It's immovable, unshakable. It's a promise that cannot fade away. It cannot fail. Ladies and gentlemen, our hope cannot fail, but our hope has a name, and His name is Jesus. First Timothy says, it's the revelation of Christ that is our hope. He's the only one that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Only one that's the same. So my question is this, where is your hope anchored? Because I'm afraid that some of you, you're writing the biggest deal of your life and you say to your family, oh, our lives are forever going to be fantastic because of this deal. I go like, watch out, watch out. There is no deal on this planet that can be an anchor to your soul. There is no new job that can be an anchor. Oh, that new boyfriend, he's not as hot as you think. He's not. Watch, 12 o'clock comes. It's going to turn into a mouse. Check it out. Don't put your anchor in a boy. Don't put your anchor in a dude. Don't go like, oh, he looks like Brad Pitt. No, 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 no. There is one who can anchor your soul. And his name is Jesus, the all, almighty, the alpha, omega, beginning, the end, the one that is eternal, mighty, that has already been in our future. The God that can do all things, that loves you, that holds you, that keeps you. He never slumbers. He never sleeps and he works the night shift when we're asleep. He's an anchor to your soul. There are three things that are forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is so I want you to ignore everything I've just said. And I want you to listen to this. Because he says, if you and I could speak the tongue of men and angels and could declare and understand every mystery of this universe, if you and I are prepared to be martyred and burned for the gospel of Jesus, if you and I sell everything we have and give it to the poor, go like, look world, what we are prepared to do for Christ. But we do not have love. I love how this scripture says it. In 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3. He says, come on everybody. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do. Come on everybody, shout it out. I am, I'm what? I'm bankrupt without love love I think in our world too many people are bankrupt they just look well dressed some of you are here at the father's house because you cannot forgive you just left a church that is your real family this is just your Hey, let's hug you and send you back, family. You are bankrupt right now. You want to ignore what you should fill with faith and courageously love. Bankrupt. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Three things will remain. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. 1 Corinthians 14, 14. Make love your greatest aim. Oh, that's so beautiful. Man, imagine. Imagine the thing we want to do the most is love. The thing we want to be is love. The way we want to live is love. 
The way we want to show the world who Jesus is, is love. But you see, when I was preparing, the Lord spoke to my heart. I'm just going to look at this camera so the Greece campus can hear me. So don't look at me, look at the screen. This is how close I'm going to get to you right now. So I didn't hear the, hear the Lord's voice audibly, but I had this very predominant loud thought. And this is what I believe the Lord spoke to my heart. And I put language to what I heard him say to me. The problem with you, Pierre, is you don't know the difference between liking and loving. You see, here's liking. We like people, and it's temporarily, and it's temperamentally. Liking, have you ever looked at your spouse and you go like, I love you so much, but I just cannot stand you right now. Have you ever looked at your kids, you go like, oh, I love you. I just can't, I don't like you right now. I'm going to share a story. My wife is at the Greece campus, so she's got to hear this. It's going to hurt, honey, but you need to hear this. <laughs> Somehow I was raised. We eat sugar on our rice. I know. I know. I thought it's normal. So every time there's rice on the plate, I order sugar. And I put sugar. Who eats sugar on their rice? Let me see. I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> So whenever my wife and I go on a date, right? We're in this fancy restaurant, and then there comes the rice, and I go like, can I get some brown sugar, please? And then I put sugar on it, and she looks at me, and it's all intimate and uh, romantic. And then the moment I begin to chew it, she rolls her eyes at me. She goes like, are you eating walnuts? Because everybody can hear you chew. <laughs> and at that moment, she doesn't like me. You know how many times I've left the rice on the plate because I want to be loved and liked. I go like, I'll never eat rice in my life in front of you again. Because why? Because liking is temporary and temperamental. This is what I wrote. Do not love like you like. Because love remains faithful. You know what he says? Love cares more for others than for yourself. Love never gives up. Love doesn't want what he doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. Love, love doesn't have a swelled head of pride. It doesn't force itself on others. It's not always me first. It doesn't fly off the handle. It doesn't keep a score of the sins of others. It doesn't revel when others grovel. It doesn't take pleasure in flowering of truth. It puts up with anything. Trust God always, always looks for the best. Never looks back, but keeps going to the very end. Three things will remain, faith, hope, and love. But we're not called to love. We are commanded to love. A command is not a suggestion. Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you will love others as yourself. Guys, let's dim the house lights just for a second. So this Thanksgiving, I've got a whole bunch of people coming to my house and you've got a whole bunch of people to my house and my house is fine. So everybody that's coming to my house, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to other people, okay? You're fine. But you know, there is always that one person. You're going to be facing family and you said, I'll never eat with them a turkey again. Well, you're about to. I'll never have them in my house again. Woo! They come in. We are called to echo faith, hope, and love. So this little card that I have says, I'm thankful for, and I'm going to celebrate. Shannon is going to come and sing a beautiful song and I want us to use the the song the lyrics the words the melody the melodics of this song to help us hear the whispers of God before I do 
Greece campus, I'm going to pray and Pastor Luke is going to walk you guys through it. But for some of you, this is not the only card. I just feel in my spirit that for some of you, God is challenging you today to put faith in your serving and to sign up for the first time. Because you know, if we all sign up, nobody's going to wear a serving heart. And we can host those that God assigns and sends. Say, Jesus, we will be the smiles and the hugs and the hands that tells a nervous world of your hope. I believe with this card, this one goes with it. And you fill this out and put it in the back. But for these cards, I pray that you would take it home and will be part of your thanksgiving conversation. So, Heavenly Father, as we take the last four minutes in this service, I pray that in all of our campuses right now, that people will not plan their exit, but they will sit back and allow your spirit to speak to their heart. God, faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. 